Hey everybody and welcome to Bits of Board, where we're talking board games, miniatures, cards and dice. My name's Michael and today we're taking a look at Tekkenu Obelisk of the Sun. Tekkenu is an action selection dice management point salad kind of a game. Here players take on the role of Egyptian nobles building the great temple of Amun-Ra and its surrounds. Players will take their actions, honouring the different gods, developing the area, and at the end of the game will be judged based on the points that they've accumulated. But the journey is just as important as the destination, and as players take their actions, they must take into account the position of the sun in relation to the towering obelisk that sits atop the board. Not only that, players must ensure balance is achieved in the actions they take, with failure to do so causing points to be lost or dropping down in turn order. This is definitely on the heavy side of the Euro game scene with a lot of things to consider in both cause and effect, but heavy or not guys and gals, I am super excited to take you through this one. Tekkenu is the joint effort from the minds of Daniel Toshini and David Tortze, designers of such renowned games as Teotihuacan, City of Gods, and Anachrony, two of my absolute favourite games. If we're allowed board game dream teams, this is surely one of them. Now, in this vid, I'm going to take you through setup, as well as a bit of a teach of the game, and then I'll come back with just a couple of words for sign-off. You ready? <laughs> Let's get in. To set up, place the board in the middle of the table with all resources, scribes and faith tokens nearby. We then place the obelisk and the obelisk wheel in their position with the wheel in a random orientation aligned to a space in between two sections. Over the course of the game, the obelisk will be rotated and on some of these rotations we'll need to score points. To help visualise when these scoring events will occur, we'll place two scoring tokens around the obelisk. The first scoring token will be placed four rotations away, so from here, one, two, three, and four. The second scoring token will be placed a further four rotations away, one, two, three, four. The area surrounding the obelisk is split into six different sections, each representative of an action that a player can take over the course of the game. These actions are set up in the areas surrounding. First, we'll set up the Horus God action, randomly placing the six Horus bonus tiles on the spaces provided. Now, if you're new to the game, you can go ahead and skip this and just use the values printed on the board instead. Next, we'll set up the Ra God action, gathering our pillar tiles, shuffling them, and placing three face up in the display. The rest should be kept in a pile face down nearby. Next, we set up the Haitha God action, simply placing a single gold resource into each of the indicated spaces surrounding the temple complex. The Bastet God action will be set up with the player pieces, so we'll skip that for now. Instead, moving to the Thoth God action and filling up the first two areas of the card market with the cards indicated. Throughout a game of Tekkenu, a player will encounter five different types of card. During this part of setup though, we're only interested in two. Blessing cards, which provide powerful one-time bonuses, and technology cards, which provide ongoing effects. Now, quickly, as a side note, if you're playing a two-player game, make sure you leave the technology card T16 in the game box. Here, we'll go ahead and place two blessings and one technology in the first section, and two blessings and two technologies in the second section. Finally, we set up the Osiris God action, placing one gold into the squares indicated in the workshops and quarries two on the statue spaces at the top, and one next to the second row of the Osiris action area. Next, we prepare the draw bag, from which we'll be drawing dice to place surrounding the obelisk. In a four-player game, all dice are used, but for a three-player game, two grey dice are returned to the game box. And in a two-player game, one dice of each black, white, brown and yellow are returned to the game box instead. We add the remaining dice to the bag and we draw to fill the obelisk. 
we'll be drawing three dice six times, placing each group of three in one of the sections surrounding the obelisk. Go ahead and roll each group while placing and assign them to rows depending on their color and position of the obelisk. Now, we'll go over exactly what this means at the end of setup. So for now, just roll these dice and we'll come back later. For now, we'll just move on and set up our players. Give each player a player board, one gold, one scribe, and all the pieces of their color distributing as follows. Place all buildings in the building spaces along the top of the board and all statues on the statue spaces along the bottom. Place one production marker in the lowest space of each resource production track, keeping all pillars off to the side. Moving to the main board, each player should place one circular marker on the 10 space of the victory point track and their happiness and population markers as displayed in the two and five spaces respectively. That just leaves one final circular player marker each, which we'll place once we've determined initial player order. Continuing with our player setup, we're going to be dealing with the rest of the cards. Here we'll introduce the decrees, which act as a player's secret objective, starting cards, and destiny cards. Like our technology cards, if you're playing a two-player game, make sure to place D20 back in the box. Here, we'll deal two decrees to each player, of which they must choose to keep one. Now, remember at this point of the game, the obelisk dice should be sorted into their positions, and the position of these may influence which decree is chosen. Finally, players will now draft their starting cards. The cards chosen here will determine not just the player's starting resources, but player turn order as well. Place a pool of five, seven, or nine random starting cards for two, three, and four players, with the four destiny cards placed nearby. Beginning with a random player and continuing clockwise, players will choose one of the starting cards and then in reverse player order, choose another. Next, a player should sum the values printed atop their cards. The player with the highest combined total will go first, with next highest going second, and so on with this initial turn order being determined in descending values. Players should place their last remaining circular marker in the turn order track in the order established here. In turn order, players will now choose one of the destiny cards available and then collect the resources depicted on that and the chosen starting cards. Return all starting cards to the box, place the destiny card next to your player board, and the game is all set up to play. Whew. Now, before I go over actually how to play the game, there are a few mechanics I would like to cover, including a concept relating to dice during setup. This is the notion that all dice placed on the main board are either going to be considered pure, tainted, or forbidden based on where they lay around the obelisk. See, the obelisk wheel is made up of three different colored shades, representing the amount of shadow cast by the sun around the obelisk. Dark, shaded, and sunny. Now, depending on the color of the dice placed in the location and the level of the shade, dice will receive one of these three ratings. Now, the formula for determining the rating is printed on the obelisk board, but as an example, I'm going to go ahead and set up these dice here. We'll begin with the full sun area. In these locations, both black and brown dice are considered forbidden. So, we'll go ahead and move them into the forbidden section of the board. Next, we would move any grey or yellow dice into the tainted section, and finally, any white dice remain pure. In the shadowed section here, we have only pure or tainted dice. None are forbidden here. Black, gray, and white are tainted, while yellow and brown are pure. We'll do the same for the second shady section on the other side of the wheel. Finally, we move to the dark section where only the black dice are pure. Gray dice are tainted, and all other dice are forbidden. 
Now, it's very important to remember that while you're categorizing these dice, that you maintain the facing of the dice across every movement. You don't want to accidentally re-roll these dice. Now, there is one more thing I would like to cover before moving into the how to play part of the video, and that is the structure of the game. Each round of the game is made up of one turn from each player. Here players must take dice from all around the obelisk wheel and then take one action, either a god action based on where the dice was taken or produce resources based on the color of the dice taken. Play then moves to the next player. Every second round, the obelisk is rotated. When this happens, new dice are drawn, rolled and placed into the shady sections, and then all existing dice are reassessed based on their position around the obelisk. This means updating their rating of pure, tainted or forbidden. Every second rotation, a ma'at phase occurs, evaluating the balance of dice that players have taken over the course of the game so far. Players are punished and rewarded accordingly. And finally, every second ma'at phase results in a scoring phase, evaluating the pieces each player has added to the board. After the second scoring phase, the game is now over. Now, the game's structure certainly sounds complicated, but the design of the game really lends itself to keeping track of things. Each round consists of every player having a turn. Every two rounds equals one rotation. Two rotations equal one ma'at phase, two ma'at phase equal one scoring phase, and two scoring phases equal one game. 16 rounds in total. Cool! Alright, with the dice evaluation and structure of gameplay covered, I think we're ready to take a look at how to actually play the game. A few things that I've skipped over, like how dice are evaluated during the ma'at phase, will be covered here. So a round begins with the first player choosing a die and taking an action. This is the main decision a player has to make and is informed by three things. Number one, what god action the player would like to take or which resource they would like to generate. Number two, which dice are actually available around the obelisk. And number three, the classification of the die and the value of its pips. The actions we will cover shortly, but for now, let's concentrate on the dice themselves. Firstly, a player may only take dice that are pure or tainted. Forbidden dice are, well, forbidden. When a die is taken, it is placed on a player's player board on the scales. Which side? Determined by the dice chosen. Pure on the left grant positive points and tainted on the right grant negative points. During the ma'at phase, players will be judged on the balance of their scales, weighing up the total value of pips on the pure side against the total number of pips on the tainted side. Ma'at is the Egyptian goddess of truth, justice, and cosmic order, and so rewards the balance of things. Because of this, a player may be swayed in their decision to take dice based purely on the value they need to achieve this balance. Now, there is more to the ma'at phase than just dice pips. Players must also take into account any excess resources produced and may offset their scales with faith tokens, either positive or negative if they choose. The ma'at phase, though, we will cover in detail a little bit later. For now, just know, players with low negative balances lose victory points, while players with even balances are rewarded with a higher position in turn order. After a player has taken an action, play moves to the next player in turn order. Or, if they're the last player and have exactly two or four dice on their player board, they complete one rotation of the obelisk. And if four dice have been placed, a ma'at phase occurs. Like I said though, the action a player can take depends on the dice, their value, and from where they were taken. Should a player choose to take resources instead of a god action, the type of resource granted is based on the color of the dice. Yellow dice grant papyrus, brown dice grant bread, white dice grant limestone, and black dice grant granite. 
the number of the resources produced is equal to the value of the die. This value is compared to a player's production marker of the same good, with the player receiving the maximum value it allows. The remaining resources are added to the tanked side of a player's scales. Should a player, instead of taking resources, choose to take a god action, the type of action is determined by the section of the obelisk from which it was taken. Now here we'll begin to see some of the puzzling elements that a player will come up against. What they want to do is really governed by how dice are rolled. And while this is largely true, players are still given a tool to help change their luck. Scribes, which can be gained in game, can be cashed in in one of two ways to change how a dice can be utilized. One scribe on their own can be spent by a player to change the value of a dice up or down one value. Noting here that ones and sixes do not wrap around. So while one scribe can be used to change the value, two scribes can be cashed in to take an Anubis action. Anubis is the god of the afterlife and the patron of lost souls and the helpless. So it's only fitting that he gives players the most flexibility in their times of need. An Anubis action allows a player to take any dice from anywhere around the obelisk and take an action. Now, there's a lot of any's going here, so let me clarify. A player can take any dice, including the forbidden dice, from any location to take any action. That is any action relating to the location or not. Incredible flexibility here, with only the pip value of the dice mattering when taken. But even more incredibly, if a player has enough scribes, they may use even more to change the value of their dice, one per pip. All right, with all that mitigation out of the way, it's now time to take a look at the six different god actions relating to the obelisk. The Horus god action allows a player to build one of their statues, either dedicating it to the people or dedicating it to a god. The chosen statue must be taken from the leftmost position with a player spending granite as listed under the chosen piece. After payment is made, the player then chooses a location to place it, taking any gold resources present placed during setup. Should a player choose to build for the people, they may place a statue in one of the four statue spaces outside of the obelisk area. There are two spaces printed near the temple complex and two above the workshops. Statues placed in the temple complex will contribute to victory points awarded during the scoring phases. But as far as immediate benefits go, on top of the gold taken, a statue will award an additional three victory points immediately for each of that player's pillars in the same row or column. Should a player choose to instead place above the workshops, the statue will contribute to the majority of two columns during the scoring phase. Now, instead of building their statue for the people, a player could dedicate their statue to one of the gods. Should a player decide to dedicate their statue to a god rather than the people, they may place it in one of the spaces surrounding the obelisk. The value of the dice chosen determines which god the statue is dedicated to. In this case, the die chosen was a four, so this statue will be placed in honor of Horus. After placement and from now on, whenever another player takes the associated god action, the player with the statue will gain the bonus printed next to their Horus bonus tile. Worth noting here that not all placement locations are available at all player counts. The Ra God action allows the player to build a pillar within the temple complex for a number of victory points and rewards. Here, the player will take one of the three currently available pillar tiles, pay the cost depicted on the tile, and then place it on a space in the temple. The pillar tile taken depends on the value of the dice. A five or six gets you the first pillar, a three or four gets you the second pillar, and a one or a two will get you the third pillar. Here we chose a five, so we'll take the first tile. The player pays the cost indicated by the tile, in this case, for limestone, and then places the tile in the temple complex, gaining rewards based on how it's placed. 
The tile can be placed in any empty space in the complex in any orientation. For placement, the player will receive the rewards indicated on the space covered by the tile, one victory point for every edge matching a like-coloured edge, one victory point for every building in the same row or column, now this is not including statues, but grants points regardless of ownership of the building. The player then receives the number of victory points as listed above the tile purchase location. And finally, if the colour of the tile matches the section of the obelisk wheel currently associated with the Ra action, the active player may immediately activate the ability printed on the tile. Here our Ra action is associated with Shadow, and our chosen pillar tile is Sunny. This means no further rewards, however, if we did have a match here, our player would gain three additional points of population. Once all rewards have been finalised, the player will place one of their coloured pillars atop the newly placed tile. The Haitha God action allows the player to construct one of their buildings in the area surrounding the complex. The player may choose any space, paying the cost depicted, anywhere from two to four bread. They'll take their leftmost building in their building track, placing it in their chosen space. Worth noting here that like the Horus action, not all placement locations are available at all player counts. Once placed, for each space in the same row or column of the building placed, the player will gain three victory points if it contains a pillar of their colour, or one of the depicted resources or faith if the space is empty. Now, none of the corner locations of the temple complex actually contain resources, so these award nothing, but here our player would receive one bread, one papyrus, and one faith. Even though three faith are depicted in this space, the player only receives one when completing this action. Finally, the player receives population points equal to the value of the dice used in the action. Now, we'll talk about the population marker in a sec in relation to the happiness marker, but for now, know that when it reaches 9 or 13, new cards are added to the card market as depicted. This is represented by the added colour in the space. The Busted God action allows the player to hold a festival increasing the happiness of their population. The player must pay to Papyrus and will gain happiness depending on the value of the dice chosen. But we've got to note here that the happiness marker can never move beyond the population marker. If the die used was a 1 or a 2, the player gains 2 scribes. If it was a 3 or a 4, they gain 1 scribe. And finally, if it was a 5 or a 6, they gain nothing. Although, the first time the happiness marker reaches 16, 19 or 21, that player will gain 1 gold, 1 scribe and 1 extra action respectively. With the extra action being of any god, with any value, without taking a dice. Very powerful. The Thoth God action allows the player to take cards from the market. The value of the die chosen determines how many cards can be taken, with the player's position on the happiness track determining which section of the market can be taken. If a player uses a 1 or a 2, they may take one card for free. If they use a 3 or a 4, they must pay to Papyrus to take two cards. Finally, if a player uses a 5 or a 6, they must pay three Papyrus to take three cards. Here, a player must spend all resources required and are not allowed to pay part to take part. Now, a player is able to mitigate the luck of a bad draw at very little cost, simply paying one papyrus to discard and redraw each of the cards in one section, and this can be done multiple times, and even in between each individual draw. Remember, Blessing cards are single-use cards granting immediate bonuses, Technology cards grant improved ongoing effects, and Decree cards grant bonus points at endgame. Blessing and Technology cards are public knowledge between all players, while Decrees should be kept secret. The final God action is the Osiris God action, which allows a player to construct one of their buildings as a workshop or quarry in one of the four tracks on the board. 
Buildings must be taken from the leftmost space and placed on the same row as the value of the dice chosen. The cost of the building is one happiness no matter where it is placed. The player should advance their resource markers as depicted. Here our player will advance their limestone and granite tracks by one each and then immediately gain one limestone and one gold. Now, these rewards vary depending on the level placed, but basically constructing a workshop of a high roll results in immediate rewards, while low rolls reward advantages in scoring. Also to be noted, the first player to place one of their buildings in the second row will receive the gold placed during setup. And that's it. There are all the options a player has to choose from when taking their turn each round. Every two rounds, we rotate the obelisk and roll and place new dice in the shadowed areas. Here, after two turns, we would be four dice down. And so after our rotation, we would be rolling four new dice, one for each player in each shaded section. So here's our first section, one and two. And here is our second section, one and two. Making sure, of course, to categorize our dice correctly. Pure, tainted, and forbidden. Every second rotation, players will resolve a ma'at phase before rolling the new dice. Each player determines the balance of their scales, pure versus tainted, with dice on the pure side counting as positive points, and dice and resources on the tainted side counting as negative points. Here, Players may spend faith tokens to adjust the scales by one in any direction. Players with negative three to five points lose one victory point, negative six to eight points lose two victory points, and negative nine or more points lose three victory points. Next, the turn order is adjusted with players with perfect balance, zero points, going first, followed by players with plus minus one, plus minus two and all that. Should there be a tie in determining player order, this is broken by the player with the highest unk value on their destiny card. Here, pink has three and blue has zero, so pink goes first. Players check to see if scoring is to commence, and they do so by checking the current position of the arrow printed on the obelisk board. If this arrow points at the lowest scoring marker on the track, then it's time to score. But as you can see here, this time we're pointing at the second scoring marker, which isn't the lowest. The lowest is the first one. So we still have two more rotations of turns before scoring. Players return all their dice to the bag and any excess resources and spent tokens to the supply. Players then return their destiny cards to the middle of the table and draft them again in the newly established turn order. Again, they gain the resources depicted. Then the rotation phase continues, drawing dice to add to the obelisk. Every second ma'at phase, scoring is completed. When scoring commences, players will first score the Osiris action, for each column here, players will count their buildings and statues, with the player having the most in each district, gaining three points. Ties here are broken by the highest piece, with statues being up the top. Also noting here that statues are counted twice when calculating majority, once for each column they sit atop. Next, players will score the temple complex, with each player gaining one point for each building and statue placed, and then each player's pillar will award one point for every building and statue in line belonging to that same player. So here, the blue player would be awarded three points for their buildings and statues, and then four points for buildings or statues in line with their pillars. This one here would receive one point, this one, two points, and then this one up here would receive one point as well. Players will then gain points depending on how many statues they've built, three points here, and then two victory points for every resource marker that has hit the top spot of the track. No points for blue yet. Players would gain victory points if any were visible on their building row. Here our blue player would need to have built two more buildings to be awarded points. 
players would gain three points per pyramid on the highest pyramid location they've crossed with their happiness marker. So this population marker here awards no points, but this happiness marker, had it reached here, it would award three victory points. Just moving right up here though, the happiness marker would only award six points, not one plus two times three. It's only the number of pyramids on the highest number of pyramid space reached. Sorry, that's wordy, but I'm sure you get it. And while that's all the points awarded during the scoring phase, there is still one more thing we need to cover. See, through building their buildings, workshops and quarries, players will have developed a feeding requirement for their people. This needs to be paid each scoring phase. Here, a player would need to pay bread as depicted by each bread revealed on the building track. Returning to the obelisk, the scoring marker is removed, and if that were the last scoring marker of the game, players would reveal and score their decree cards. Players would gain victory points determined by turn order with the player in first position gaining three points, and second gaining two points at the three and four player count. The winner is the player with the most victory points, with the tiebreaker coming down to the player with the highest total number of scribes in their possession, or if still tied, first player. Of course, if that's not the second scoring phase, the game continues. Players continuing with the Ma'at phase, returning dice and tokens from their player board back to the supply. 16 rounds, guys. Epic. Right on, there we have it guys and gals, that is how to play Tekkenu. As you can see, it has quite some weight behind it to say the least, but I think it's all quite worth it in the end because it's an implementation that I've not seen before. See, usually these point salad kinds of games, they're a combination of a bunch of mechanics that you've seen and used before in many games. Tekkenu here, while it is a combination of mechanics, I've not seen anything quite like it. I mean, look at the obelisk for one. It is a fairly simple mechanism built into the game, but what it does is it changes the value of dice to each player at the table based on what they've already chosen, and heck, it even takes some dice out of contention. So what we have here is a very varied setup that changes over the course of the game. And just that alone is enough to throw replay value through the roof here. You'll never come down and play the same game. Sure, there are going to be some strategies that you find familiar uh, in certain situations, but you're never going to be able to get that strategy down pat. And players are going to have to work reactively if they're going to overcome this gameplay element. And that is something I find so unreal about this game. Yes, you're working against the players, but every player is also working against this game mechanic. It is beautiful. Actually, speaking of playing against the game, Tekkenu ships with a solo version inside the box where players are going to be playing against an AI of sorts called Botankarman. Botankarman? I don't know. It introduces more pieces and a little bit more upkeep, but what solo game out there doesn't? Seriously. <laughs> now, I don't think I'm going to delve too much into a review side of things here. I'm still very excited by the game. I don't think I've got quite enough plays under the belt yet to come back and say, this is what's good, this is what sucks. But right now, I'm very much enjoying my plays. And I feel like if you're into this sort of heavy side of things and you're familiar with these designers at their work, well, I think you're going to be right at home here. So it's definitely one to seek out and get a play in for sure. And hopefully this video here has prepared you enough to be able to sit down with a little teach to get straight into it. That's kind of the aim here for sure. Alright, so that's going to be about it from me today. Um, I've got some more games to check out this week far out. It has been a very big week. Um, so I'm going to go do that. So yeah, if you've enjoyed the video, make sure you like, comment and subscribe and do all the things that you guys can do to help this channel grow. Uh, but besides that, we are about done. So as always, my name's Michael. This is Bits of Board. We'll catch you next time.